Welcome to Families Are First Teachers, a video series designed to support families who are supporting learners at home. Presently, many families are finding themselves having to help their children navigate remote schoolwork. Some caregivers say they're feeling like substitute teachers for their own kids these days. However, what we know about families is that they are children's first and often best teachers. These short videos are designed by experts in curriculum and instruction, behavior, and special education from Summit Education Service Center and some state support team, Region 8, with the goal of empowering family members for the new teaching roles they find themselves in. Four facts for supporting your young learner at home. We'll take a closer look at the importance of toys, play, and we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by developmentally appropriate practices that you can help support using the materials and environment in your home. If I asked you what you thought were the five best toys of all time, according to a dad, what would you say? I'll give you a minute to jot down one you think might made us list. Did you have a stick on your list? How about a string? Did you think about a box? Cardboard tubes? Mud or dirt? So these are the top five for this dad. Have you watched your young learner gravitate to any of these materials? If your children are anything like mine, they are often more interested in the packaging than in the toy itself. So why is that? Play isn't made better by toys. It's made better by possibilities. If you've ever watched children play with toys, or if you've ever gone to the park and you've watched your children play on playground equipment, they often get tired of playing with it once they figured it out. They're pushing a button to make a figure pop up or they're climbing a ladder to go down a slide. After taking a couple of turns, they're ready to move on. The intrigue and the challenge are gone. Think about a stick. A stick is often better than a toy that pops up every time you push a button because it can become a fishing pole, a spoon for stirring soup, or a magic wand. Children often make their play choices based on how much variability the material offers that they're playing with. If you look at the picture, you see this little guy has turned a piece of wood into a steering wheel and he's lined up blocks to show where the edges of his car is at as he's pretending to drive down a racetrack. So what is Developmentally Appropriate Practices, or DAP? This is the approach that early care and education professionals use to teach your young child. So Developmentally Appropriate Practice is grounded in research on how kids learn and develop best. It provides real world experiences and hands-on learning. And you, as you will hear, play has a huge role in how children learn and develop. So how do you know what you're doing with your child at home is developmentally appropriate? We're gonna to talk to you about the four facts you see here on the screen, and we're gonna give you a few ideas on how you can support them in your learning environment at home. We're gonna look at how academics are impacted, how language and math skills can be supported, and we'll look at executive functioning and helping with self-regulation. We'll end with some ideas to support physical movement, so important uh, with young children. The QR code and the link on the screen will take you directly to a handy two-page summary of these four facts. I'll pause for a few seconds right now so you can take a picture of the screen um, or pull it up in a second window on your computer or print it out to take notes as we follow along. 
So in fact number one, we're going to talk about the importance of play experiences to help build background knowledge, imagination, and rational thought. Young children are able to take in and understand math, reading, and writing so much more when it's done through play. So remember the five best toys we talked about earlier. Many of those were examples of reusable open-ended materials that can be used in many different ways by children. Look at the open-ended materials on this screen. How many of these do you have in your home right now? Some of the best open-ended materials for children are free and often seen as recyclable or trash. Recyclables to look for may include buttons, Kleenex boxes, rings from milk cartons, toilet paper and paper towel tubes, egg cartons, bottle caps, muffin tins, applesauce containers, cotton balls, Q-tips, and think about all the natural materials that you can find around your house. Rocks, sticks, mud, pine cones, seashells, acorns, leaves. Set up, with a, set up a scavenger hunt with your child. How many natural materials can you find in your backyard? How many recyclables do you have in your home? Set up a container or a bag to collect them with your child. How can you take photos of the objects or draw pictures to organize them into a checklist for you and your child to find and to use as activities come up or as your child comes up with things that they want to build or create? So how many recycled items do you see in this picture? I see applesauce containers, toilet paper and paper towel tubes, a recycled box of noodles is the body of one of the robots, simple art supplies like pipe cleaners, googly eyes, and masking tape can go a long way and I guarantee you will quickly become a favorite with your child. Think of all the possibilities and things they can create with just these simple objects. In this picture, children were very interested in robots from a show that they watched. The caregiver asked the children questions about the robots that they saw on the show to get them thinking about what they wanted to create and what they could use to make it come to life. Do the robots have eyes? Do they have legs, arms? Were they tall? Were they short? What shape should they be? What could you use to create it? If you make the robot tall and skinny and you tried to stand it up, what could happen? Do you think he'll be able to stand up by himself? Encourage your child to problem solve and think about the results of their actions as they're building and creating. Water is another resource that you probably have available in your home. Think about all the ways that playing with water can build on their math and science skills. Fill up a sink with water and encourage your child to experiment with different objects. Do these objects sink or do they float? They could put them into piles and then count which pile has more, the objects that sink or the objects that float. Old Tupperware containers also make a great place to fill with water and to explore. Do you have water bottles laying around that you, could, that you would ordinarily throw out or recycle? Encourage your child to help you wash them and then fill them with water. Add different color to each bottle and make a rainbow window. Place them in a sunny window ledge and notice how the colors change as the light changes. Put two bottles next to each other to make a new color and grab a flashlight and ask them questions to notice how the light changes as it moves through the bottles. The most important thing to remember as we move to fact number two is to keep learning and keep having fun with, with your child. That is what they're going to remember the most. So we just talked about the importance of meaningful play experiences in fact number one. Now we're going to talk about how to use play to help your child learn and be able to use language and math concepts. What materials do you see in this photo? Trucks, plastic figures, sticks, blocks, dirt. My son loves sticks. He used to collect them when he was younger and arrange them to build roads in our backyard. He used to drive cars and trucks around and around that track he had built. I would hear him tell a story as he drove them and often heard him announce that one car had to stop for gas or another's tires was flat. Um, bring on the air. 
he was practicing storytelling skills as he played. So allowing your child to construct stories during imaginative play will later become the foundation for creative writing. They have had practice with settings, with characters, and their own order of events. Do you have a mirror in your house that you could put down on a table for your child to play on? If you're going to use rocks like you see in the photo on the left, make sure it's a shatterproof mirror first. Changing the material that your child plays on from the carpet or table to a material like a mirror or foil or sandpaper could be just enough for them to play in a deeper way. The picture on the screen is a child retelling the book, The Mitten, where many different animals tried to fit into a mitten dropped by a child on a snowy day. This little boy expanded his play to include rocks and trees that all the animals had to navigate around to get to the mitten. If you look at the photo on the right hand side, Busy Boats uh, was a book that another child explored. A teacher encouraged children to build one of the busy boats that were represented in the book. As you can see in the photo, they used a wrapping paper roll, paper taped together, and a Tupperware container that they placed on a blue tarp to play and to retell the story of their busy boat. Do you have rocks in your yard, your driveway? Could you visit a park or a hiking trail nearby and collect a few? Children love rocks. You could create a rock garden at your house. Encourage your child to paint or draw a number or letter on each rock that they find to add to the rock garden. Paint or draw the names of family members or pets onto the rocks. As your child grows, you can use them to spell words in the grass or numbers to practice simple addition and subtraction problems. It's much more fun to line rocks up than to draw with paper and pencil at a table. If you're looking for a great book to inspire imagination and get your child thinking about rocks, check out If You Find a Rock. This book will give you and your child ideas on many different things that a rock can be turned into. Cups and cans can be used to sort objects and compare weight or to build structures with. Think about how your child is learning Think about all that your child is learning about gravity, balance, height, width, and force when they're trying to build a tower made out of cans, cups, and paper plates if you have them. Place a different number of beans or acorns in cups outside and have your child find the rock with the number that equals how many things are in that cup. Fact number three, dramatic play helps your child develop executive functioning and the ability to self-regulate. So what is executive functioning? Executive functioning is a set of mental skills that includes memory, flexible thinking, and self-control. We as adults use these skills every day to learn, work, and manage our daily life. Self-regulation um, can be defined in a couple of different ways. In the most basic sense, it involves controlling your behavior, your emotions, and your thoughts. And it also refers to your ability to manage disruptive emotions and impulses that might come along. Both of these are important skills for children to be able to practice in early childhood. Dramatic play is a child's way of pretending to be someone or something else. They're trying out the roles and characteristics of this person or thing. The little boy on the left has cut wings from a cardboard box. He's ready to fly as a pilot. The boy on the right is a robot complete with a circuit board to give him direction. So what do you have in your environment to encourage dramatic play? Allow your child to go into your closet, try on your shoes, who is the mom, the dad, the grandma, the grandpa, the baker, the neighbor, the firefighter? Think about what objects are in your closet with multiple possibilities. A scarf that they may find can become a blanket to cover up their baby, a, bl a blanket for a picnic that they can lay out on the floor, a fishing pond, a cover for a fort, or maybe a veil for a bride. Children are learning and practicing many important social skills through their play, like taking turns, sharing, 
empathy skills, and problem solving, just to name a few. So our last fact, fact number four, give kids regular opportunity to move in unstructured activity and make sure it's a regular part of their day. Going outside or in the basement allows for room to move in a safe space. Encourage your child to play games like Simon says, red light, green light, and freeze tag. This is going to help them practice listening skills, following directions, and it'll give them an opportunity to move their bodies and to play with others. Add scarves. Remember that scarf that they may have found in your closet or in your drawer? Add scarves that they can run with and move around in different directions. They can make shapes or letters or numbers in the air. Hula hoops are also great to jump in and out of, to move around, to create shape with, shapes with, or if you have ribbon that you can cut into long segments. Children love to move that around and create things with it. Play music on your phone and encourage your child to move the objects and their bodies to the rhythm and the beat of that music. Create outdoors. Use a brick wall or a concrete driveway or sidewalks um, for them to create. Fill up a bucket of water, add a few paintbrushes or toothbrushes, and watch your child paint. And then as it dries, have them um, watch it disappear and talk about why it's disappearing. You can even add sidewalk chalk and have your child draw a picture and experiment with painting water over the colors of the sidewalk chalk to make the color lighter or darker. So think about your environment at home. Do you have some of these materials that we've talked about? How could you add a few more? How could you use what you already have to support more play for your child throughout the day? When we think about an environment that's developmentally appropriate, we think about an environment where your child can create rather than duplicate, can move rather than wait, can make choices rather than just being told what to do, can appreciate the process rather than just the product or the end result and feel free to ask questions and figure out the answers themselves. Those pieces that I just read are from page two of that overview handout that I shared with you earlier. There are many, many more for you to consider and think about how you're supporting your child's experiences at home. So we need to remember that children are trying to, trying to understand their feelings and their world, trying to please the people they love, trying to grow. When grown-ups and children are trying together, just about anything can be possible. No truer words are said um, than from the great Fred Rogers. So this slide is gonna give you some of the resources that we talked about throughout this video. I encourage you to go to them and get even more ideas to support the amazing things that you're doing with your child every day. And this concludes this module on four facts for families. Thank you for joining us. If you found this video helpful, you can find additional ones just like it on the Summit ESC YouTube channel. Just visit YouTube and search for Summit ESC. There you'll find additional brief videos on self-care and social emotional needs, supports for diverse learners, developing a growth mindset, and academic content supports. We hope these videos provide some new ideas, resources, and tips for supporting young learners at home and in life. Thank you for all you do and take care.